And um, first, very quick announcement. Um, I have about 30 minutes after the class where I'm staying here, so you can even walk out. Then you have a talk, and you want to come back. I'm probably here. <laughs> so just gonna keep that as an opportunity if there's anything in feedback. We had some great discussion already on Tuesday. Um, so uh, the, uh, this module, I'm teaching on innovation via technology startups. There's already six lectures on YouTube. The Stellar has a one zip file that has all the, uh, the slides. So you can uh, follow one or follow the other. You can even read the slides and decide what you really want to hear about. I mean, I don't want to tell you what to do. But there's a lot of flexibility there. As far as how we proceed with the class, as you can see, there's 140 views of the entire six sessions. So I have to be somewhat careful. If you ask a question, I kind of have to repeat it to make sure that a lot of people that end up watching it are aware of what's going on in the classroom. And it may mean that, um, depending how it goes today, we can stop a little short and really just have a discussion. So that I want to uh, keep that window open, uh, depending how things go. So um, we will label this lecture, Lecture 7. And um, what you'll see is today is not requiring that between Tuesday and today, you've already watched six hours of, <laughs> of lecture. So, <laughs> so we'll make a very nice uh, package overview and update. And I don't think you'll find too many repeats um, going back to lecture one, essentially. That's, that's what I suggest as a path for most of you. You probably haven't seen anything, so we'll talk today. Then you can go from one to six. And even the, t the, the next lecture for me next week is not really going to require that you've already watched the six lectures. So there's a, a, you know, kind of like a one third overlap and then a lot of new stuff. Um, and you know, this may turn actually into a full 12 hours at some point um, and you know, we'll kind of provide that history. Um, so I've given some thoughts last night and this morning of um, yes, different teaching styles. Uh, you, a lot of times for, for one hour lectures, what we've been taught um, is to have only two or three things that we really want you to remember. But at the same time, if you remember the first lecture on Tuesday, I emphasize how we value self learning. So I can suggest bullets, but at the end, it's up to you, right? <laughs> My job, I think, is to expose you to as much information uh, in, a, in a constructive way for you to pick what you want to remember. Uh, so keep that in mind. Now, having said that, I went to the effort to communicate with you um, something I don't think I've communicated last year, which is my current view of startups in the context of engineering and technology. Um, they fulfill a need for breakthrough innovation. If you're a large organization, pharmaceutical, um, engineering, hardware, software, you name it, it's very, very, very hard to completely think outside the box and create this incubator that has as much flexibility and kind of a kind of a free economy concept here as you do with a really a startup company you know it, it, because if you are as part of a big organization you can be giving a budget to do something <laughs> and, and, and you can be told you know you can do whatever you want with it but that's just completely different that's completely different than young, smart, qualified people with some experience going out there saying, I'm putting myself personally in responsibility for success. And therefore, I'm going to organize, seek resources. And these resources are actually a lot easier to get if you, if you are an individual making that effort than if, you, if you're a big company. I mean, a big company can't come to MIT, get so much free help for doing something. It wouldn't make sense, right? But as individuals, 
That's, and that's really, really a strength of the ecosystem here around here in Cambridge. There are tons and tons of resources. I mean, you can go to free lectures on this, on this, on this. You have to kind of eventually just narrow it down to what's most helpful to you at a certain point in time, but I can't emphasize how many resources are out there. You know, so, um, and that actually in itself make it very, very challenging. What do I do tomorrow morning? Because there's only so many hours in the day, right? And how do I go from one thing to the other? But as far as uh, a startup being challenging for everyone involved, I will use an example, and uh, yeah, I think it's, it's fair to use. Um, say two years ago, uh, I was in a very, very detailed conversation with my team, a big company and their team about doing something for them, you know, something big. And they couldn't wait six months, you know, it had to be in three months. And they were gonna do this, they were gonna do that, and we spent like two, three weeks really focusing on that opportunity. And then nothing happened. They disappeared. <laughs> okay. And you kind of, you, you have to deal with it. It's part of the risk, right? We spent the time. Some of it was very useful because they were willing to explain to us exactly what their problem was. And this was not a problem that was unique to them. So that's part of why we made the effort, but still, we were out there with equipment ready to go without test piece, without purchase order, without anything. And I just called the meeting and said, so are we just completely off of this? Oh, no, 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 we just delayed and delayed and delayed. So instead of just saying, yeah, we're sorry, we're just not going to do it. They just kept dragging it on. So I had a a little bit of a heated discussion with a senior VP for this, you know, billions and billion dollar company where he just didn't understand. You know, he could not understand what he, his company has put us through. And it was very, very painful, okay? Because they were for a period of six months or focused. And instead of right away saying, we don't, we don't want to do this. They really, really, really wanted to make it sound like this was still going to happen. And I have to say, even today, they came back. <laughs> but <laughs> so, of course, it did teach me a couple of lessons, okay? The first one is your customers are the biggest liars. They are. I mean, that's, that's what I've learned later in a sales class. And I wish I knew it, you know, a year earlier, right? And that's why we talk about priorities. You know, where do you go? What do you learn? What do you think about? Very, very, very complex. Now, I want to address something that does come up in talking to a lot of people, my friends, customers. Everybody thinks of startup, oh, you know, one out of five, one out of eight. I don't, you can hear all sorts of numbers fail, you know, succeed. And the other ones, you know, there's a bunch that kind of make it through, break even, and, you know, more than half just don't really make it. Um, my view on it is I've seen a lot of personal story people uh, going out of school, getting a good job, this great organization, and then all of a sudden, the supervisor switch or something like that. And they really just get into a tight spot. I mean, it really happens even in the best organization. Oh, that company gets acquired by another one, and for a year or two, you know, nothing gets done. So, <laughs> uh, I personally, this is where, of course, it's my opinion that risk is relative. <laughs> so you could be working two, three years for a startup company, doing your best, seeing what happens, or you could take that position that does look secure. You know, it comes up with all that retirement package and you know, whatever you, you, know, you, you could possibly think of, and there's people there that's been there for 30 years, but are you gonna be there for 30 years? Well, no, you're at the bottom of the, you know, of the, of the ladder there. And if you're in the middle, that's actually probably a tighter spot <laughs> to be in, in a large organization. So, um, so I wanted to share that with you because uh, you know I I know that uh, you're young, you you haven't seen it all, um, and you know we do go through these interviews sometimes. And uh, actually, this is becoming a little bit our probing: how much time we're going to spend with a candidate? You know, whether they really understand the difference? Uh, because we had situation where you know. 
you put the offer out, and then they decide to go for this big company. What happened? Well, you know, it sounded risky. Okay, sure. But, well, next time we'll know that in the first 20 minutes. <laughs> We're not going to go through this entire process. Um, so that's really what I wanted to share this time. And of course, there's a lot more to it. Uh, uh, but I thought those thought were applicable um, to what I've seen and I've heard of because my personal philosophy is, you know, the day I decided to become an entrepreneur, I became friends with more and more entrepreneurs, okay? So this is not just a story about my, my things. You know, I've seen a lot of other things and I take classes sometimes, very condensed one yesterday. Uh, I ended up having two people coming with management issues during a webinar, but they gave me the slide, so I still <laughs> learn what I need to learn. Uh, so it's just part of the process. Okay, so one thing that I didn't do as well uh, last spring, and you'll get the benefit here, is instead of kind of bringing in a little bit here and there, piece of the example of, of my experience, I decided to just put it up front there and, and, and discuss it a little bit. So. Um, so it's not a repeat, it's really more an overview uh, for most of it. So as far as the accent, I'm from Quebec, Canada. So uh, you can call me Simon here in class, there's no, you know, I don't, I can hang out with a lot of different people and with you guys I'm here to help you. That's my goal. Um, I was at MIT feeling a little frustrated with the the process of doing research, I was totally able to do fully qualified. That is not what I wanted to do with my career, the academic research. So I did an industrial internship. I had to lobby for it. My thesis advisor was head of department, didn't like it, but made it happen. Um, when I graduated, my topic scientifically was very close to what I ended up doing. So there's full disclosure there. Um, I worked as an engineering consultant for a big consulting organization, about 400 employees. I was the one metallurgist. So there was a lot of kind of trust building at the beginning. I was the first one. They didn't never had a guy that you know, could really in-house, they could call on. So it started from a lot of probing and I didn't have all the experience, but quickly I ended up doing a hundred different projects that I would build to. At the end of the year, you analyze that. And, uh, you know, I was not really being compensated necessarily for all the greatness. Uh, so after a while, you know, I started thinking about what I'm going to do. Um, it did provide for tons of exposure, analyzing, you know, I was on the team for the World Trade Center collapse. I was on big crane projects, a lot of stuff that, you know, could go up and, come, and eventually comes down because it was a mostly structural engineering firm, but also uh, product failures. So and some litigation consulting. So I became a testifying expert. I was 30 years old or something like that. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> you see the Longfellow Bridge, right? That's the or Red Lion Bridge. <clears throat> so I was under that bridge with that job one day because it was built in 1905 or something like that. And there was, you know, Henry Ford was out there, but you know, there wasn't too many cars. So these were horses going through the bridge. Uh, not really salt. I mean, things were just very, very different. And steel manufacturing was very different. So those arches, the uh, Recreation and Conservation Department here in Massachusetts said we want to keep them if we can, because replacing them was 500 million or something like that. Uh, just kind of fixing them would be 100 million. So. Great cost saving here, but is the steel good? You know, can we, can we count on it? So this, this, the senior guy, you know, bridge, you know, great with customers. You, you, you get these big consulting projects to work for the state on this. He says, Simon, we need to verify the strength, but we don't want to count, we don't want to cut this out everywhere, you know. What can we do? Oh, well, you know, the hardness tester and trying to, I mean, I, I knew it from school, right? Uh, but now I was just really faced with it in practice. Like, gosh, yeah, he wants it. I can't give it to him with any accuracy. I mean, we went and poked the steel, just looked like we were trying to do something. But, uh, you know, the data, there was so much variability. 
uh, and you have a lot of components. So these, what's this plate here, there's an angle, there's another angle, so it's very, very complex. So even if you cut one piece out, you still don't know the other. Um, so anyhow, um, then more and more, so we were not making progress <laughs> with respect to determining the yield straight, and more questions were coming up. You know, is there any distress? Does this, did it get permanently deformed? Did you add plasticity on some of those components because of the peer settlement? <laughs> so as time was going forward, the number of questions was going up, and the, you know, the real creativity of finding a solution didn't really quite scale with it. So, there has been a lot of judgment and estimate being done because that's the only thing they could do. Had they had access to a tool, they would have used it. Um, so anyway, that was year 2010 approximately, and you know, it was great, there was a barge under this thing, the red, the red line comes by, everything vibrates, and you, you wonder why, why you're there. <laughs> um, so anyway, I told you a little bit the story why I stayed five years there at that consulting company and then I co-founded one in 2011. That's called Materials and Engineering Group. So who asked the best question gets a pen from that today. Um, and um, it was a great opportunity to come back here. So I have been lecturing since 2011 um, on different topics over time. Um, and then I had an idea. I was really having a drink with a friend, talking about stuff. So then, you know, kind of this, uh, this vision of taking what I did for my thesis, but making it into a portable tool, but in a, in a way that, you know, there's something that just came to my head, like how to do it. And the idea is kind of a tripod. So you can have stuff and, and, and run tests, but if you really guide it in a, in a smart way, and stay perpendicular to the surface, now everything becomes easier. You don't have to worry about vibrations. If you self-guide, self-orient the stylus and make it into contact. So it really came as, gosh, you know, it, that could take care of sample curvature, but also make the sample portable. What could we do with it? So we did a little uh, you know, business competition and did already kind of find out about these pipelines that are out there that people don't really know what they are as far as the quality of the steel. So kind of really incubated quickly here in 2014. Um, we filed an LLC and kind of, I was just using some money from the consulting company, you know, some reusing some profit to cover just basic expenses of getting stuff machine, trying a few things out, going to meet people. Uh, but in 2015, we uh, hired a real Builder, so his initials are BMW. <laughs> so, so, I'll keep that like that for now. It's a, it's good, it's a good story, very consistent. Um, and uh, the, it was a really, really awesome decision. So at that point, we had essentially a team, and he kind of over time just keep making miracle happens in terms of getting something physical to move and test and learn from it and then make a better one and make a better one. So that's been our process that I described that in a class. I think it's lecture five or so, five or six. Um, so it's really in 2016, if you look at our bank account, it started going down. So BMW was full time. Other people were in the co-ops, this and that, and we were spent out spending money. We had a, a fund, we had an SBIR program, but it only covered about half of what we spent for r and So we had to go and uh, raise capital. Luckily, we had a lot of friends and family that could contribute. So it really was a bootstrap uh, type of model at this point. So we worked on convertible notes, so not issuing equity right away uh, for the company. Uh, so we started making sales. Oh, so that was great easier to get money. Um, so I remember we had this burst for a two months period. We were $150,000. And it's fair, I kind of knew it was not going to continue forever, but <laughs> we had the numbers, right? It's just, woo. 
So we just raised more money. Uh, and, and we're able to plateau, because it didn't keep going like that. It really, really plateaued. So we were still getting work, but not more. It actually kind of slowed down for a six month period. And it's a totally normal process for something new. It doesn't matter how great it is. People will want to try it, and then they're going to think about it <laughs> as far as whether they're going to really move forward with it. So it's just, think of it this way. <laughs> and I have a, somebody that has more experience than me that is suffering right now from this because he's told his investors, we're going to go like this, and it's, you know, going like that. Um, but it's, it's out there, it's, it's in the literature, uh, it's something I do discuss, I believe, in, in lecture six. Um, but um, anyway, we think we're out of it. Uh, we've grown now more uh, sustaining customer, recurring customers. They're very happy with what we did, then they say we're gonna do more. We, we know them, we know they say a certain schedule, some of them is exactly that, some of them drifts. And knowing all that at this point is very, very helpful. So in a very, very uh, succinct way, we are at a stage now of really having to build a company. And when I said that at our open house a month ago, I made the joke, said, you know, it's not that we don't have anything. You know, we, 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 we all had our uh, little polo shirts with the logo. And <laughs> that's, we have shirts. <laughs> you know, and we, and we have a bank account and, you know, we have customers, but... We're not really, you know, an, an organization that people think of as a company. You know, we're pretty, pretty lean at this point. Um, but uh, speaking, of, so as far as those bullets at the, uh, at the bottom, um, if I had to really know what was going to happen to move forward, would never, never, ever, ever had happened. Almost every three months, now every year, had a situation, you go around the, the team, and we don't know if we should take that risk, okay? We just don't. <laughs> Eventually, if you don't move, not doing something is deciding also. So you have to force yourself into these decision points of we're going this way or we're going this way. If you stop, that's the one thing that I have seen other people. If you start and get scared, gosh, you can slow down. But if you really stop and get scared, I think that's, that would be one mistake, really. Um, and then as far as what you need is, of course, you need to be smart. You need to seek resources. And in combination with that, you have to be very, very driven. And there's a little color to that, and I, I think, uh, We'll talk about that. Um, it says some things like intellect without will is useless. And that's a little bit what we discussed in the first lecture. If you have all these ideas, if you're not going to take them forward, who will? I mean, you own the idea. So, you know, it's just, it's, why, why would anybody else do it? Um, and will without intellect is dangerous. So, <laughs> so you want a combination. Um, all right, so Terry, uh, Steve Blank is uh, sort of the father of the thinking on lean startups, lean company building, um, and he gave a lot of presentation. You can find him on YouTube and listen to a lot of his stuff. This is really the summary, and I wanted to use it here more than ever because we're kind of recapping, and then we're just going to plow right forward. But see, the first three things talks about customer. It doesn't call talk about product. It's implied. Of course, you're going to be building something, <laughs> or so you're going to be developing a service. But don't assume you know at the beginning who's going to buy it. You're probably mistaken, unless they've already written your check. Uh, so the, the process of customer discovery is very, very, very involved. And, and, and I spent quite a bit of time there. So it's really the, the very brief overview. And when you think you have your customer, eventually you do have to move ahead and, and validate. And when we talk about validation here, 
pretty much figuring out if they're going to write a check. Just a very simple way to think of it. If they don't, you're back to square one. <laughs> Go for another one. <laughs> um, now, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, uh, to be said about not having enough confidence to go in front of the customer if you don't have something really, really to offer. Um, if they face into this situation, call me, okay? We can talk about it. We can phrase what you're gonna have into something that you almost already have, okay? Uh, and not focus the discussion on trying to sell it, but trying to learn whether it would be a value to them because that's what the only reason they're gonna write checks. So if if you can't, it, in other words, when you do this customer validation and customer discovery, you're not really just trying to get a yes or no. You're really trying to build the history and, and the understanding of why from their eyes, if you put yourself in their shoes, why they're gonna do it. And if you do have that reason, that's called a value proposition. You're in good shape. <laughs> if you almost have it, you're just gonna be exactly in the same boat that I am. Five years later, we're still talking about value proposition, right? But uh, so some cases can be very, very straightforward, saving tons of money no, tomorrow, okay? That's great. But with breakthrough innovation, that's very, very hard to realize. You're not talking about replacing, you know, I don't know, a car with an SUV or something like that. You know, you're really, really changing the way they do stuff. Um, now, of course, when people start writing checks, you have to take it and you, because this is a big, big mistake, especially engineers do. Oh, it's doing great. What? You got happy because you had, you know, this much sales? No. You just got to plow right through it, okay? So if they want three times more, somehow <laughs> find a way, negotiate the timeline and so you can find the money, the people, the, and, and make it happen. But this, this process here, as soon as they start writing check, move ahead, make them customers. Somehow, okay? We're all smart. Um, and then if you're able to do that, then you start, you stop again, you're like, okay, now what are we gonna do? And, and what I mean here, what are we gonna do? Uh, it says company building, that's his way, but there are other options. You can license your technology, you can partner. There's a lot of things you can do when you start being at a certain level, and that actually is something that, of course, we have to consider uh, at, at our stage right now. So we're, we're right here, and we're probably gonna be there for this year trying to figure out exactly, I mean, you like to think, yeah, we just made this organization chart, we hired three people, and you know, now we have a company. No, it's not, it doesn't work this way. We still are honestly trying to find the best way to deliver to our customers, that's called a, our, our sales channel, essentially. And, and, and so we are mostly inclined to do it ourselves so we can capture more market as opposed to going with a strategic or a licensing agreement, but, um, you know, this could even change between now and two weeks when we talk about uh, this process of getting the customers. So, um, all right, so what's the module exactly? Um, I do talk about ideas of kind of giving you the, uh, some uh, personal experience there, but there are concepts about how you um, come up with ideas and how you execute them. Uh, this whole discovery process in these six lectures, oh, I, I, I wish I had this because I talk to you guys about how to interview people. I talk about how to think of making decisions, moving, not moving, going back. Um, so yeah, there's not much that um, I, I would change if I had to do this again because um, I can condense it to you in 30 minutes, but it's a process <laughs> to learn. So going through it is really the way when I built it a year ago, these six lectures, I was kind of going through it in a way that um, I think is, has some logics uh, to it. And as you've seen from my very big overview, customers, customers, sales. If you, if, if you can't get yourself to start thinking that way, find somebody 
to partner with that's going to do that for you. <laughs> that's, that's all I'll say. <laughs> and it says, I'm not saying don't do it, right? Just, find, just make, make the initial team, make that good, good judgment call as to uh, what needs to happen. All right, so today it's an update. And um, what's going to happen is um, when going through this, this is a, the, the, when you are going through it, it's very cloudy how you end up managing to make a sale and go from one sale to the other and build a tool around it. But what we're going to do next, next week is really talk more globally about that strategy. Of, of doing it as opposed to the, 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 the rope. So you, when you go to the first six lecture, it's kind of pull that chain and make this happen and, and do this and do that. So here we are gonna be taking a little bit more of a step, step back into the entire process. And then the subject of team. And um, because we right now, with 12 to 14, it just depends if you count uh, co-ops and other people, but uh, we have to move to 20, and I'm not pretending that I know all that's going to happen. So I made that there as a topic because it's going to be continuing on, essentially. And one thought I had, as you'll see, is uh, failing to commercialize. That's the number one reason why a startup fails. And um, hiring poorly is the second reason. So it's kind of like going to be really going to those two core issues uh, after today's lecture. Um, now, let's go through that summary, and, and we'll go quickly. I'm not going to try to read the slides. Um, so creating ideas is, um, to, in my perspective, um, a lot about challenging yourself. Uh, my wife says, necessity is the mother of invention. So if you do put yourself out there and make the commitment to try to come up with something, you're more likely to do it <laughs> than if you don't. Uh, so that's a, that's a personal opinion. Um, and the more you try, the more you, you, you're going to do something great. They talk about artists, uh, you know, all these people painting poems, that the best painting they ever did is the year that they did the most as well. So um, volume matters. Um, and then, of course, you have to screen them. <laughs> there's, no, there's no question. So there's a book reference, and I'm going through the details of what makes individuals more prone to have ideas outside the box, more breakthrough ideas or not. So some people are more kind of conforming to things. Some are just very resilient to adapt to you know, an established way of doing things. So that can help you. I've always been you know, kind of rebellion, uh, not in a way to get in trouble, but not in a way of just you know, not specifically looking for the rules and making sure I follow them. You know, Looking at the rules and making sure that I could get through and still respect what I want to do. And it's been kind of my operational mode. Um, so the last thing uh, about ideas, and there's the difference between some of those great discovery that were done from people in their 20s versus people in their 40s, right? If you look at uh, Steve Jobs, he did his best work in his later years, okay? Um, so that's the difference between somebody just gifted on a certain theory versus somebody that kind of builds off experiment that they acquire over time. Uh, so that's just a, another, another concept. So. If, you, if you're young and you really have like this out of the sky idea, then it's, it's kind of a, a gift that you have. Uh, if you're an experimentalist, I would argue that a lot of it is also hard work and challenging yourself in, in multiple areas. But that's really just a personal opinion. Okay, so this is one view that <laughs> it's important to know if you think generally, and this is apply, applicable totally to almost every engineering. You're here, you know, you get, and that's, that's the uh, National Science Foundation here. They make an estimate as what they, in average, they fund for research. 
and it, a lot of it is academic research or government lab, it's a discovery stage, you know, trying to find a new way to build something or analyze something or a model way to create a better understanding, things like that. So, um, of course, at this point, you have a lot of idea, a lot of potential, right? But nothing really, really created. You know, you'll write a thesis, most likely. There's not because somebody, somebody that's going to take it next year and do something with it. My thesis advisor told me very, very clearly, said, Simon, I want your thesis to be something that's going to take 10 years to be applied. And that's actually one rule I essentially follow. Okay, well, if you go back to the chart. Uh, so think of, a, yeah, something like this, this from here to here is 10 years. And then you can have another 10 years from there to there. So like a 20 year process, a lot of times, for something that very, of, 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 of high significance. So um, if you think you're gonna do it all in one year, um, it's really a breakthrough innovation. I mean, it's okay, because now you have will. <laughs> I suggest you go and get some knowledge to adjust a little bit the perspective and, and see what you can do. And there are tons and tons of resources, but essentially a startup, the goal is to get through that valley of death. That's because it's tough. Nobody else will. So it is a very, very, very specific purpose. Maybe you'll like that much better than my three bullets, but <laughs> that's, a, that's really is up to you. All right, so you have to commercialize. This is a definition from Downbreaker. It's a big big firm that helps companies with commercial, commercialization of new uh, products and services. So uh, the process of developing market and producing and delivering, that's the word I like. If you don't ship something, whether it's a report, a product, or you know, fix something for somebody, you're not delivering, so you will not be making sales. So, um, Commercialization, as far as a startup, is expected and <laughs> highlighted monitored because uh, I, I, this, this blew my mind at the beginning because you, you, ha you have to have confidence, okay? But then you, you meet with investors and they're like, so what's your projected sale? You know, show me by quarter, okay? And then they just take that and they put that here. Okay, all right, I'll see you later. <laughs> and then they come back <laughs> six months. So what did you do, <laughs> okay? so. It's monitor, okay? <laughs> Just make sure you know that. Um, but it's a great thing too, because everything that is monitored tends to improve, right? <laughs> if I monitor my own weight, I tend to stay on track. If I feel fearful of <laughs> measuring it, then I completely you know, lose the momentum. Okay. Um, small business innovative research is a government tool across many, many uh, department function. Essentially, each department has a research budget and they have to put a certain fraction of that total budget into these programs that is research done by small businesses. They just, they can't use that money themselves. They have to give it away to small businesses. So it was maybe 10 years ago, so it's, there's still some process there into how it's being done and how agencies think of it. Uh, as far as I know, the National Science Foundation is the one agency that has taken a lot of leadership in making that program an incubator for real, you know, good-sized companies. Uh, so if, if you go for Department of Defense, they will tend to sponsor things that they really want to buy, regardless of how big the market opportunity is, whereas the National Science Foundation will kind of look at your plan, your commercialization plan, as a business opportunity as opposed to being a potential buyer. Um, so there's a lot of details in that slide, and I found it helpful because you know, it says here, for example, when you, uh, when, before you get money, 
you don't, you're not really expected to build anything. <laughs> so they expect that you're going to do a proof of concept uh, when you're funded in terms of you know, application. And a lot of people do feel compelled to have it ahead to win the grant. But how you can articulate your plan and the, the research you've done in terms of the application is a lot more helpful than you know, showing, uh, showing that you have a lot of will <laughs> and gonna, you know, build stuff. Building stuff is, is, is possible. Uh, prototypes, they talked about it as being a phase two. So just in terms of budget here, you're looking about $150,000, maybe 200 these days and prototyping between 500K and a million, something of that order. Um, then you get you the second phase two demos. I think that that's all depends of who, who was your sponsoring agency. Um, the NSF really doesn't do two phase two, but they have a phase two B program. And then they talk about a product to market after that. So you could get through this at about four or five years, like what we're trying to do right now. Uh, and we're kind of fast, according to a lot of people. We tire people up. Um, so one concept that I think is helpful that I never covered before is the technology readiness level, TRL. That's something as an engineer, again, you're going to face these things. You're going to want to know. Am I going to spend time with this company? You know, and, they, and you can ask them, what's your TRL? Then you write it down, you go and visit them, <laughs> you decide whether, they, <laughs> whether they're legit or not. What's their level of integrity? Okay, so that could save you a lot of time uh, to ask them ahead. And um, of course, the reality of things is if you're going to build something that it's going to be really useful to somebody. You really want to engage with them early on. You have to find a way. You just don't want to uh, overpromise. You see, you can get funds for doing stuff, small funds, successfully if they really have the need. But you have to scale. Essentially, you have to evaluate yourself because you're the one who knows more at that, what you can deliver in a certain time frame for a certain amount of money. And with the understanding that it's a risk, and, I, and I'll tell you one of our examples, our very first purchase order, we did not have piece of equipment at all. It came, of course, because of relationships, um, networking. Um, so we used lab equipment to, uh, to provide the testing. And guess what we learned? It really wasn't even going to be good enough. We knew right away from that project that if we were trying to take you know, a, a super sophisticated commercial setup, that itself was not <laughs> It was bad news, OK? <laughs> but we learned it quickly. Uh, that was 2014, I think. Yeah, December 2014. Started running tests on actual samples from a customer. Realized, oh. Even with that great machine, so it's not an effort just taking the lab machine and making it into a portable machine. The lab machine wasn't able to do it. Um, but we didn't lose the customer because it was pretty clear what we were going to try to do. Uh, we had established the basis. But they said, you know what? We're going to take our sweet time now with you. <laughs> so <laughs> same customer 18 months later says, I will give you $3,000. I almost cried. You know, I needed 10, but they said three. Um, you're going to come to us at this facility and you know, show us what your tool can do in this one pipe. It's just testing one pipe. Yeah. Uh, we had to say yes. You know, that was something actually our corporate attorney taught me early on. Is somebody's ready to write a check, take the check <laughs> and then figure it out. <laughs> OK, so we take the check, and um, we ended up having to go twice, OK? 
but same exact story. We learned so much. It was very stressful, but we learned so much. We got done in three to six months time frame, which could have taken years. If we didn't actually take the machine, put it on the plane, get there and test their pipe for them. Because we, we had our own little ways of doing things and you know, that was fine, but all sorts of issues with electronics, hardware, I, I, everything are very, very, all of a sudden, oh, I guess that's what we're going to need to do <laughs> if we're going to make this. So, so let's say that was in, uh, I would say, March of 2016 that we did this. And uh, by the time it was September, we were out making money in the field. Uh, but we, if we didn't do that trip to that, to that warehouse, we were not making it. We, we, we were, and, we, and if we were not making it to do the field work, we were not getting enough money to raise to continue on the next year. So it was very, very simply put, a no error path. No error. You can't, <laughs> you can't screw up. <laughs> You're out. Um, and does that say that in the summary here? I think it did. Yeah, make or break. And one of our co-founders said, I'd rather burn up in flames than die slowly. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it was it, it kind of, I mean, it, was, it, it, it wasn't pretty. Uh, <laughs> so, um, oh gosh, I got a lot more material. Maybe we just move to questions. Remember, get a pen. <clears throat> so there was a, a moment where you uh, were describing that um, you went and talked to a customer and they reject. Um, you were kind of uh, inferring that they were like, or they, your perception was that they were liars and you cannot um, drop trust them because they were kind of. Uh, giving you the idea that they will buy your product, but they do not. In that space, do you feel that they, you could have done a better job? Because of, like, if I think about it, they, obviously there's someone interested that cannot bypass like a senior leadership or the person who makes the decision. But under that person, there's some people that are interested, and that's why they're kind of yeah, very good question. Yeah. All right. So, kind of try to, a very well phrased question. And I think the essence is I mentioned the word customers are liars as a general sense. And this is something I've got from a training class. So, I just want to clarify that. And as far as what I should have done back then, if it was to do it again, I would have done the exact same thing except at the very end, tell them what I taught, okay? <laughs> so, um, and what I mean by that is this was the same way, this is, this is connected to what I, I was, we were describing. We talked about the lab testing that didn't go well. We talked about the first visit somewhere that didn't go well. This was gonna be the real pileup. This was gonna be doing, you know, a lot of work. And it forced us to think, how would we possibly do that? And when I said, you know, we were working on it, we were not ready to deliver. So this was kind of a real life training experience on how to get ready ahead of what we could. Now, it made our life hard because, it, and it was frustrating, but to some extent, it did help us in, in our journey because six months later, we did it, but for another customer. So, as far as your question about how to trust, you can trust people individually. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can be certain that what they say is what's going to happen. You know, people have a lot of integrity generally, but the larger the organization, the more complex it is on how decisions actually get made. And, uh, and therefore, that refers to what I said at the beginning of not trying to get just a yes or no but really questioning and understanding the, reason, the reasons behind it. Um, their reasons, I understood them, 
and they were significant enough, but somehow they kind of uh, they kind of find instead of action, they did use the excuse they had a plan. That's kind of what happened, and it's not something that I could have predicted. And uh, we talk about that all the time in sales. Is you can't pick and choose. There's stuff you don't know. And therefore, the best strategy is to have multiple paths, which we did. You know, they were not the only one that we were working on. But back then, we could have been working with 10 companies as opposed to three or four, for example. And that's something that we fixed. Now we have 50, which means that we have a lot of work to do. And people call in now, so it's, a, it's becoming a challenge. But yeah, so this is a, it's a perfect question because we'll stop the tape. I'll just say that making mistakes is awesome if you can learn not to do this exact same mistake again. Okay, <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs>